it's 10 a.m. on Thursday and it's time for Business Morning. So let's use the next 55 minutes for current and relevant business conversation as happens right here on Business Morning. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Well, we continue our countdown. It's 12 days before the expiration of the old notes. There have been complaints that banks are still giving out old notes. We did bring you a report on that yesterday. So uh, this morning, we do know that the central bank uh, and its officials are on a monitoring duty to see what deposit banks are doing and giving out uh, all through, at least here in Lagos. But we'll see how, what they find out and what they share with us at the end of the day. Meanwhile, we'll be asking you to share your new Naira note experience. And we said you could do that by sending us a mail at business morning at channels tv.com business morning at channels tv.com we do have some mails that uh, some people have shared we have one from bob etemiko he says that he's seen them but not spent or withdrawn them the banks must begin dispensing them now or chaos looms that's the observation of bob there then we have from ibrahim yunusa the experience i had with my notes is refusal of a petty trade to collect the new note saying it's fake Naira, which I concluded that CBN has to do a lot in orientation and reorientation of Nigerians in cities and rural areas. I guess that's what the CBN is trying to do this morning and uh, they started last week. We also have a mail from Orogun Richard. How will this work when we still get the old notes as withdrawals from our banks? Big question there for deposit banks and the CBN to answer as they do those uh, monitoring duties this morning. Adeoku Adekwe Valentine says there really can be a new Naira experience if one can get this said new Naira. Repeated trips to various commercial banks have not yielded a same to it. Seems the POS operators have more of the said new Naira notes than the banks. Not sure the CBN thought this through quite well, or maybe we're not well informed. Not sure that the 31st deadline is sacrosanct. So those are the mails that you have sent sharing with us your new Naira Note experience. You can still share yours new at uh, businessmorning at channelstv.com. Send us a mail and we'll have it on the show. Don't forget, it's 12 days before the 31st of January when the old note is supposed to cease to be a uh, uh, legal tender in Nigeria. Moving to other issues now, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed, has said that the country is planning to reduce its debt service revenue ratio and the government is not planning to explore the bonds market in 2023. Well, Mrs. Ahmed shares that the federal government is working to reduce its debt servicing to revenue ratio from 80%, which is what it was in 2020, to 60% in 2023. Debt data from the Debt Management Office indicate that the country's public debt rose to 44.06 trillion naira in the third quarter of last year and is expected to hit 77 trillion naira by May when this administration is supposed to come to an end. However, the minister has promised that once uh, they pull off the fuel subsidy and production of crude increases, then uh, that there will be sustenance and improvement in the situation and they'll put in place terms of non-oil revenue that should be able to come down and achieve that 60% revenue to debt ratio. Staying close to that, uh, I know some of us might have seen that story yesterday that said Nigeria will borrow 1.2 trillion Naira bonds in the first quarter of this year. We've also heard that the Nigerian president, Muhammad Buhari, is pushing lawmakers to let him add unpaid $50 billion overdraft from the central bank to the country's public debt. So while the uh, minister is assuring us that there will be no borrowing or not excessive borrowing from the domestic front, we are hearing this. But uh, let's get uh, someone who we know understands some of this and can help us to understand that. We have Mr. Bismarck Rwani, Chief Executive Officer of Financial Derivatives Company, joining us virtually from Victoria Island. Mr. Rwani, good morning. So on the one hand, we hear the minister saying that they are working to make debt to revenue ratio come down from 80 to 60%. On the other hand, 
We have 1.2 trillion uh, bonds for first quarter of 2023. We have 50 uh, billion dollars uh, debt, and, and I mean, it's just so worrying. Help us to understand the true picture from your perspective. Good morning, uh, Ine, and uh, good morning to viewers. First of all, let us understand some the no country pays off its debt. What you do, you refinance your debt with new issues. So the 1.2 trillion Naira bond issue program is probably going to be used to redeem some of the existing debt. So it's more or less a reissue. But it's important to note that what is the debt profile of Nigeria today? And you talked about the debt to revenue ratio. If your revenue growth is, if your revenue is growing at a rate slower than your debt is growing, then your debt to revenue ratio will always deteriorate. And also it is clear that the borrowing profile of Nigeria 10 years ago and what it is today, the trend is quite worrying because one is growing, two, we are not able to, there's, not, there's been no increase in productivity as a result of this borrowing. And on the asset side, we cannot point to the assets that we've used the borrowing to achieve. Power supply was 3,000 megawatts before, it's still 3,000 megawatts thereafter. Uh, the growth is still suboptimal. So uh, that's the important thing. Now, what to do with the new money if you are raising new money? One is to retire existing debt or refinance that debt. And two is to use it mainly for capital projects and also to look at one, the deficit of the budget this year and the capital projects for the development plan. That is what this debt or this issue is going to be uh, addressing. But again, you must realize that there are all components to our debt. There is the domestic debt funded by the Central Bank of Nigeria, which is the ways and means securitization issue. Two, the domestic debt funded by the markets. Three, there's international debt funded by multilateral agencies and concessionary uh, loans. And four, there's the uh, private sector debt, international debt, which is called the London Club. That you can see that. So if you look at the Nigerian debt profile, it is becoming much more critical and much more, we are becoming more vulnerable to our creditors. And only this morning, Ghana announced, uh, because if you are, once your GDP per capita is above $2,000, I think, you no longer qualify for concessionary loans, right? And therefore, a country like Nigeria, in going to do its rescheduling, which it will do after this, when a new government comes in, we have to make a provision for that. And the minimum time between when you start the negotiation and when you close it, you, if you are lucky, you close it in one year because the conditions are onerous and they're very tight. So what are we going to see? We are going to see the, the, uh, what they call it, the securitization of the ways and means advances to 22 trillion or 23 trillion. We are going to see these issues which will be used to finance debt and what will happen to push up interest rates significantly in the domestic market make bring closer to inflation. Three, we are going to be engaging with our international creditors, both at the multilateral level, that is the IMF, the World Bank, and then also we have to engage with the London Club of Lenders. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very high hurdle and a big task for whoever has the misfortune of winning the election. <laughs> Mr. Rowani calls it misfortune. Well, the politicians who are campaigning don't see it that way, so I do hope that they have the answers. But let, let's bring it home to households, for instance, impact on dis disposable income, whether it's at 60% uh, debt to revenue ratio or 80%. What are the implications? What does it mean? Well, okay, you say debt to revenue ratios. Again, I, like I said earlier, if your revenue increases because oil theft has been brought down, because you have liberalized your rules so that money what um, illicit and, and, and legitimate financial flows come into the bus bucket, things can be better. What we've seen is that the more draconian your rules are, the more monies bypass the normal corridors and the less the economy benefits from the integration of, of the Nigerian economy with the rest of the world. So I, I, I suspect and I believe that we are going to see a liberalization of policies we are going to see a much more efficient management of exchange rate mechanism, money policy, and all of that. Everything driven by the fact that we have to we have to come to some terms with our creditors, 
not because anything else, but just because of that. And I think that will make things better. Uh, the government announced, I think, this morning that the subsidy reduction stroke removal policy will start on April in April this this year. Uh, you recall that it was on April 1st, 2020, that we started a lockdown. So again, fast forward three years, four years, we are here. That's 2020 to 2023. Uh, we will be, we'll be dealing with another April Fool day, which is uh, dealing with the subsidy removal. And that will help to a large extent to remove the, uh, to remove part of the distortions that you're seeing today. So generally speaking, um, the, the, the government, that is this administration, is going to lay the foundation for the next administration to work on. So the, the hard decisions, the difficult choices are going to be made probably anytime between February 25th and May 29th, and the rest will be carried on by whoever comes into office. In essence, Mr. Rwani, you do see this promise of the minister that they will be able to cut down the debt to revenue uh, ratio to 60%. You see it happening before the end of this administration? No, that's a wish. Right? But it's a, you know, as Shakespeare said, if wishes were also beggars were right. So, I mean, it's a wish. You, if, if, if we've been there for the last eight years and we didn't do it, how, what will make it happen in, in the next eight weeks? So, I, I think that it's just, She's setting the tone. She's saying the right things, and not to get creditors worried about it. I know for sure that Nigeria is not going to default on the debt. I know that it's a tall order to issue 40-year paper for nine at nine percent per annum with a three-year moratorium. I don't think those things will fly. The reality is the market will determine what the real price of our debt is, and the market will determine where we go. But if the productivity and the growth increases, then naturally. Your, your revenue will increase and your debt service as a percentage of your revenue will actually decline. So it is, it is wishful thinking, but it's also possible. And it, can, it will be done as long as you can make sure that you achieve growth rates in excess of three, four, five percent, which is possible and doable in the near future. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Bismarck, Rani, for sharing your perception. Uh, we always... Uh, Appreciates your time and your perspective. Uh, do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for having me. All right, still talking about the economy now. NESG yesterday met and they shared their macroeconomic outlook for Nigeria for the year 2023. Will Ibong was there to cover it and filed in this report. It's the launch of the 2023 macroeconomic outlook for Nigeria with the theme. Nigeria in Transition, Recipes for Shared Prosperity. This support may not necessarily be directly based. Like other economic think tanks, such as the World Bank, the NESG expects the economy to grow by about 2.98% in 2023 amid the election year. While the overall global picture is gloomy and many economists see the chance of a global recession, the CEO of NESG, Mr. Jayo Lalaoye, is cautiously optimistic. So if you pull back subsidy and get about six trillion naira, if you again appropriately price naira and the subsidy in the FX that are going to people's pocket is dealt with, you might bring back another three trillion naira. If you then deal with things around leakages in terms of taxes, our assumption is that a new government that will come in will take charge, will work. And they've talked about what to do about security. So if they walk the talk, at best we'll probably do about 2.9. That's our uh, very optimistic assumptions, which is not uh, what we should be doing as a nation, knowing the fact that uh, our, our population is growing far beyond that. So we're not having real growth. But it's better than going negative. For the former President's Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, Engineer Manso Ahmed, sharing prosperity should go hand in hand with building it. I feel a sense that we are placing, creating, or what is it, expanding the prosperity uh, above sharing the prosperity. I think the two must go together. Because if you don't work on sharing the prosperity, 
even as we are expanding it, the gap is going to continue. Because it is the activity or the result of sharing prosperity that will boost the prosperity from the bottom. While some sectors, such as trade and telecommunications, are expected to boost growth, the NESG believes the government needs to prioritize its policy focus to drive the country's growth engine. Well, still staying on the economy now, Alliance Risk Barometer 2023. They have shared the risks ahead of the country this year. And top on that list, of course, is economic and political risk, violence, top threats, as well as corruption, skills and energy risk are also top on the list and also the shortage of working skills. But let's uh, get details of it now with uh, Mr. Duron, Duron Adeyemi. He is the head of claims with Alliance Nigeria. He joins us also virtually from Lagos Island. Mr. Ademi, thank you so much for your time and good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Great. So tell us, um, we, we see what you have listed. We see that you have macroeconomic development, the issue of inflation, deflation, monetary policies at 46%. Uh, that's almost half of the entire risk, even higher than politics and violence. Uh, tell us how come uh, you have this higher? One would have thought that political risk is, is going to be the highest for Nigeria for this year. Right. Uh, you're right. Um, when, when, of course, professionals came in and we had this, this assessment, uh, macroeconomic development came the highest. Of course, the impact on our business is very is immense uh, over the last uh, two years. What, what we have seen post the pandemic is that a lot of things have uh, changed in the financial landscape and it has affected the buying power of the people, uh, affected uh, income from investment, as well as other in, uh, financial indices. What we're also experiencing is, is that the, the, the rate of inflation at like, you know, over 20% is also very high. And business owners and risk managers have identified that as the highest risk. Um, interesting, you're also, this is not a uh, situation only in Nigeria. Uh, a lot of uh, big, other, other bigger countries in Europe, even China, are experiencing uh, similar concerns. And interestingly, also, in the world, uh, macroeconomic development is also top three. In fact, number, I think across the world, it's the third uh, biggest risk that, uh, that we have identified. So it, it's a fallout of uh, the pandemic and the crisis uh, that we see between uh, Russia and Ukraine, of course, without an effect, is what we're seeing in the ranking indices as shared by uh, uh, Parameter 23. Okay, when you say theft and fraud, uh, if we could have that uh, slide now, we see theft and fraud has 17%. Help us to understand what do you mean by the theft and fraud? Where is that? What are the scenarios? Right, so. Yeah, what, when we talk about risk, we, we talk about what we expect to happen or the fears or the expectations in terms of what the economy is seeing. So I'll give an example. Post the uh, uh, lockdown, we had some protests in Nigeria. Interestingly, we had the entrance process, protests as well. And we saw that there was large-scale uh, vandalization of property and theft. You know, people broke, breaking into, into uh, companies, breaking into retail sales outlets, I think, are cutting up, uh, cutting away their materials. So this week is likely to continue based on what we see in terms of uh, macroeconomic development, the low funds in the, in, the, uh, in, in the public, and also because there seem to be uh, some weakness in security apparatus. We expect that um, theft and fraud will increase. Now, if you remember, remember cyber incident is number three on the list in Nigeria. Therefore, fraud in there would relate to also um, targeted attacks, you know, via online means at businesses or at private individuals to attempt to take away um, things from them. Corruption is one, one thing that we've always talked about in Nigeria. And because of the uh, lack of funds in the general public and the rising cost of living, we expect that um, this risk will be something that is very important for us to check in the coming year. And this is why we see them, see that at number five on the list this year. The issue of shortage of skilled workers. Does it have to do with the JAPA syndrome? Are we expecting more JAPAs in, in 2023? 
Well, yes, um, the shortage of skilled workforce is actually a direct result of the, the, the Japa wave that they experienced over the last um, 18 months. Um, risk, risk managers in Nigeria expect that this will continue, and we've already started feeling the effects in the corporate business and the financial institution um, in Nigeria. Um, the, the, the reason for this is many of the companies have said, and, and, and this is reports from, from business owners and CEOs, they spend a lot of money on top skilling and training people, and what happens is after a few months, these people have to move on out of Nigeria in sector of um, greener pastures. So, of course, this is the risk that is inherent. We already experienced it in the, in the industry, and we expect that it will continue. Um, also, one of the things that we see driving this um, migration is also the instability you know, or changes in legislation that can affect the earning power or even the business environment. A lot of uh, uh, people are unsure what to expect in the coming year, especially in that election year. So we expect this also to continue into the year and business managers are, and business owners have been advised to plan uh, towards uh, being able to manage these incidences when they occur. So it, it's a ready risk and we expect that to continue going forward. Okay, it will be interesting to know if these risks are only high before the elections. Um, after the elections, perhaps we should have more stability. Do we expect the threat and the risk to reduce or are they still going to be this high? Well, we, we believe that the coming elections and the 2023 uh, list of IPIM, things that are expected to happen, uh, would have a direct impact on the result of this assessment. Because this assessment was done uh, in October, November last year. And we, we had a fair idea of what to expect in 2023. However, uh, when we consider the risk at the time of consideration, we always look to the future to say what do we expect to happen in terms of trend. Um, we don't expect this risk to disappear. Possibly, for political risk especially, things might change a little bit when we carry out this um, assessment at the end of the year. But between now and at least nine months into the year, we expect that this is what we will see uh, in Nigeria. Um, the outcome of the elections and the effect of some of the legislations we have seen or regulations, especially with the Apex Bank, would also um, give us an indication as to whether or not some of these things might change. But I can assure you that within, within now, the next nine months, we expect that the, the risk environment in Nigeria will look uh, this way. All right. So um, to households and businesses, uh, even, even for politicians, is there any way they can hedge against at least most of this, uh, the inflation, uh, the political risk, violence, theft? Shortage? Is there anything individuals, households, or businesses can do, you know, to protect themselves, even if it's just partially? Well, uh, I'll say, first of all, for businesses, um, we've seen, um, after identifying this risk, we've seen a lot of businesses take um, risk management very seriously. And in taking risk management seriously, of course, it means that they've also now begun to put in plans you know, and, and methods or ways to be able to mitigate or reduce the effect of some of these things that we have pointed out. So, for instance, we see a lot of companies are taking business continuity management very seriously, such that if they have ransomware attacks or they have a break in supply chain, they have a second alternative um, to, to kickstart the businesses. We have also seen a lot of businesses now um, create what we call training schools, be able to have a ready pipeline for the supply of skilled uh, workforce in case that they have all of these conditions. Um, for households, um, one of the things that we've seen is what we call, what some households call austerity, austerity measures. They have begun to adjust the, the livelihood or the living environment to be able to respond to what we see in terms of the financial environment. Um, we expect that to continue. Uh, as the buying power of the people reduce and as we respond to the changes in the, in the business environment. One of the things that we also see with this report is that um, APCS uh, and Alliance being a partner is not only interested in risk transfer or what we call insurance. We are also interested in helping people, companies and households identify their risk and plan towards uh, uh, you know, effectively managing these incidences when they do crystallize. So there are a lot of uh, you know, measures that people have been taking uh, to be able to manage this risk when they do come. And, and for me, that's a positive in terms of the uh, awareness of the risk environment and the changes in, in the economy as it affects um, individuals and businesses alike.
All right, uh, Mr. Duron Adeyemi, thank you so much. Head Niron Adeyemi, uh, thank you so much. Head of Claims with Alliance Nigeria. And because what we're doing here actually is to uh, let our viewers know the risks ahead so they can actually plan for it. Thank you so much for sharing your reports with us this morning. Thank you for having me. All right. Let's take a break now. After that, we'll head to commodities and a whole lot of markets information coming for you here in Business Morning on Channel Television. We're having a whole lot of conversations. I hope you're not just joining in the program because if you are, then you have to go to our website, YouTube, and watch uh, what we, you have missed. We've spoken a whole lot about uh, Nigeria's economy, what to expect, and how you can hedge against some of those risks. Now let's talk about commodities. And we have uh, Dumi Biolu-Wale joining us in the studio now. She's Senior Associate with Financial Derivatives Company. Hi, you may be. Good morning. Good to have you second time this Thank week. Thank you. Good morning. So inflation is out, but now oil is up. Is it just about China that is driving it up? Uh, no, not really. There are actually two aspects to it. So there's the supply side, there's the demand side. On the demand side, we have China. So the fact that China's economy has reopened and we're seeing an increase in demand for oil, and that's, you know, um, propping up oil, oil prices or actually just creating some buzz in the oil market to keep prices high. Then on the supply side, we have the price caps on um, Russian oil. Um, and also, there also and now there's, by February 5th, there will be another um, set of sanctions on refined petroleum products from um, Russia by the EU. So that as well is also weighing in on the um, global market for oil. But really, what is driving um, the current rally in the oil market is actually um, China, China. Yeah, China, China's economy reopening and the prospects it has for demand. So um, the EIA, that is the International Energy Agency, they actually um, um, forecasted that because of Chinese, um, because of the increase, you know, in Chinese demand, the expected increase in Chinese demand and how that's going to support prices, they're expecting global demand for um, oil to to rise this year um, to about 100, 101. Um, million barrels um, per day. So that's a really huge uptick compared to what you know it was last year. And to show how significant China is to the global economy, not just in terms of the oil market, but trade in general. China currently accounts for almost 18% of global GDP. For global trade, um, it accounts for about 14% and almost about the same thing for um, global exports. China is the largest oil importing country and also um, one of the largest oil refining uh, um, um, country. So on a global scale, China has a lot of, you know, impact. And that's why you see whenever China, whenever something is happening with China, China it, affects it affects the oil prices it affects globally. Oil prices but, but, and but, also, what, what, um, this, this would, I mean, this could be good news for Nigeria, especially since we've ramped up our uh, oil the production, production yes. dealing with uh, uh, oil theft on the one hand, and then in preparation towards the removal of the subsidy, yes, hopefully this yes. time it will go through. Well, I mean, ho hopefully this time it will go through. Um, the expectation is that it's going to be a gradual phasing out. So in the um, 2023 budget, there was still an 18-month you know, extension period for... for um, I think that um, expires in for, June. Yes, it expires in June. So And they made a provision for, for um, full subsidy payments of about 3 3.6 trillion naira, so that's still going to take us into um, 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 the half of the half of the year. So, um, barring any, you know, um, withdrawal, you know, or uh, um, or pushback from from um, the federal government on actually removing fuel subsidies, we should see that actually happen this year, um, as long as they don't take back their words on, mm. on doing that. So that could actually happen. But like you rightly said, with all prices, you know, trading at what it currently is and the expectations that it could actually increase further considering We're that going to be paying price... more for subsidy. Exactly. So we're going to be paying more for, for fuel subsidies. But at the same time, um, with, if our oil production, the hopes that our oil production actually continues to, you know, creep up with the level that it is, 
we should be able to see some level of respite from them. Mm, and, I, and I think um, most of the presidential candidates, at least the ones on, in the front, have said they're going to take off the subsidy. So, yeah, it's uh, a huge hope... selling point right now. <laughs> <laughs> a huge selling point to, to, to voters, <laughs> you know, considering the fact that it's really eating into the purse of the federal government. 13 the trillion NNPC, naira. Exactly. The NNPC throughout last year wasn't able to remit any cover to um, the federation account. And, that, and that's where um, the, the monthly factor disbursements come from for each fed for each state um, government and um, when you look at the share of federal government um, look at the share of FAC to um, internal generated revenue you see that a lot of uh, almost almost half or almost or actually about 33 33 states out of the 36 states in this country depend highly depend on on the fact this busman that they receive every month for the federal government I think in the last state by state report by budget you have only about three states that's Lagos State, Rivers and I think um, Anambra State were, were only able to were the only states that you know had their IGR significantly higher or at least higher than um, um, their, their fact disbursements to show mm -hmm. how show how dependent a lot of yeah well that, that, that opens up another conversation of exactly. you know states and sub-nationals looking inwards and using the resources because every state in nigeria has agriculture yes. mineral resources yes. it's just for the for, for the government to look inwards exactly. use the people exactly. you know that are there to, to make the most of some exactly of uh, um well yeah that's that's a very huge argument to that um the other aspect to it is that um the role of governments generally sub-nationals at the federal level however way you want to look at it, is to actually encourage businesses to come into their states. To actually, make the you know, environment make the friendly environment and friendly attractive. Enough. Exactly. Exactly. Because the role of the government is not to create jobs, but to actually create a, create a safe and a friendly environment for businesses to thrive. Businesses are the ones that create jobs. The more businesses you have in your state, the more opportunities, the more employment opportunities, the more taxes, the more taxes you can get. So generally, um, it just boils down to the fact that governments just have to stick to the most important aspect of their of their um, um, of their role in terms of nation building. Mm. And then we also see on your slide that uh, liquefied natural gas plunged. What drove that down? Well, what's happening now is um, that we're seeing um, a different, we're seeing climate change take effect, basically. So the weather is not really as cold um, as, what it, as what, it, what it used to be um, previous years. So clearly um, we're seeing some level of decline in um, winter demand for natural gas, for heating demand for, for, for natural gas, and then also um, the EU, also the EU as well, um, they have a lot of gas reserves right now. So that's also having some level of impact on um, their demand for for um, for natural gas. So that's what's happening with mm. natural gas and prices. So clearly, climate change, which was one of the which is one of like the hottest topics at the um, re, um, recent or the ongoing uh, World Economic Forum, and um, that's a Davos conference that's happening. Climate change was it was a really huge topic, and we can clearly see how that's you know um, playing in the world generally. Mm. And then we can also see that uh, con uh, like the Europe, European countries said they are going to be looking to countries like Nigeria. Yeah, for, well, yeah. For Ho gas. So hopefully we're able to produce. We're more. able to exactly yeah. we take care of ourselves, and then yes. you know because we had a conversation yesterday, and it seems like we may be more available to exports than to use yes. for domestic which is yes. unfortunate but maybe thank you so much for sharing your time and your thoughts with us <laughs> this morning and uh, just before do maybe walks out uh, will ibon comes in with uh, uh, red market reports from yesterday. Oh, Ini, no, I don't, I don't come with a red market report. Red market I reports from yesterday. I come with a report from the traders, okay. the investors. Okay. I, I, I'm not going to read a red market report because it's, it's going to rebound. We're seeing a choppy session. <laughs> so it's the, the equities market traded on a star note, unfortunately. Uh, is, well, Amy was right. So red reports for the yesterday's trading session. And Dangote Cement was a big culprit in yesterday's trading session. We saw the stock price lost about 1.9% yesterday. And it's not open the market. 270 naira, but closed at 265 naira in yesterday's trading session. All, accordingly, we saw the uh, all share index dropping by 0.16% to stand at uh, 52,605 points. Our market cap is still at the 28 trillion naira mark. And total volume yesterday, we saw decline by about 4.6% to 207.95 million uh, units valued at 4.47 billion naira and traded in over 3,000. 300 deals. Sterling Bank 
was the most, most traded stock by volume yesterday? We saw Girigu was the most traded stock by value. It had about 1.35 billion naira traded at yesterday's trading session. But we have, uh, for more details, um, looking at sectoral performance, before we go to our analysts, we saw the sectoral performance was a bit of a mixed uh, bag yesterday. We saw banking up, consumer goods down, industrial also down, insurance and oil and gas. Well, we're in the green in yesterday's trading session. Now we have Oyin Koshola, Arik Beshola. She is a re investment research analyst with ARM Securities. She's going to give us insights as to what's making the moves in the market. Good morning, Oyin Koshola. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. Good morning. Uh, yes, so Oyin Koshola, so choppy moves for equities. I see the big guys are making the calls. Sorry, I didn't get that. The big guys are making the calls in the market. We're seeing Zenith Bank, Gary Goo, and uh, Dangote Cement making the calls and pulling back the market. In, I mean, pulling back, you know, stocks in yesterday's trading session. So what are you going to talk about that? What, what, what are your insights into that? What's driving the sell-offs in those stocks? Yes, yeah, so, um, I mean, for, um, for Zenith, I mean, for a while now, we've actually seen, like, um, a bullish sentiment. I mean, even for us, for talking about the Banking takers generally, yeah, we've actually seen um, a positive sentiment in that regard. So uh, I would say that you know probably you know, yesterday could actually just be um, some investors you know you know having like a um, profit taking activities you know in that particular ticker. Um, there's really no uh, there's really nothing serious you know uh, um, in that line. I mean talking about fundamentally wise ticker is a good. Um, um, so maybe probably um, investors are actually having profit-taking activities, you know, in that line. So that's 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 the reason why we see, you know, sell-off, you know, in that regard. Yeah, so the movement is a bit choppy. We've seen this pattern like green, red clothes, green, red clothes. Is that going to be sustained? Are investors a bit uncertain about what the market holds for them. Well, um, I wouldn't say they're uncertain. I mean, there are, there are some sectors that um, actually bought more for, um, that we'd actually see that we should actually expect investors to start um, taking, um, having buying interest in. An um, example is the banking tickers, even as they, as they um, prepare to release their full year results, um, and as well as the tech holes, and that's the LTL and MPN. I mean, we actually have a, a, a very good reason to to expect um, positive positive results um, in their full year um, financials, and that should actually drive the prices up. I mean, even for um, specifically the banking sector, we're actually seeing that um, currently. I mean, we know that you know most of that we they have a lot of fixed income securities in their books. I'm seeing that, uh, I mean, at that point in time, you know, most of them actually held it at um, high high yields at that point. I mean, so that means, you know, right now it's, it's actually going to be a uh, positive, it's going to um, cause a positive impact in their books, you know, when we see their 2022 um, full year results, seeing that yields are down in the market and, you know, you know prices are up. And so uh, that should actually cause, you know, some buying, interest in the banking um, tickers um, going forward and uh, as well as um, dividend dividend um, hunting activity should actually propel investors to also buy in that line so what stocks are making moves in the market this morning okay so uh, i'll say that um, generally we've been seeing interest um, in in the in the tier one banks we've been actually seeing um, buying interest as well in and the telcos, like I mentioned earlier, that's Etel and NPN. And I mean, the major reasons that we would actually expect or we would actually see buying interest in these because is you know, because of the mention, uh, because of the factors I've mentioned you know, before. So, how do you think the market is going to close today? Are you bullish or bearish? Are you in control? I mean, barring um, um, further sell offs in um, the big. Um, and the big guys or the big pickers, we should actually see the market close positive today. Mm. Thank you so much, Oyin Koshola, Arik uh, investment research analyst with ARM Securities. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. Thank you for having me. Now, but it's a different picture for the NESD market. We saw yesterday's trading session, it closed up.
positive 0.74% to stand at 703.43 points. Market cap is at 924.31 billion naira. And um, volume traded, 85,000, over 85,000 units traded, valued at 7.06 million naira. Deals, 10 deals and stocks traded only four stocks. We're going to look at the stocks traded yesterday. We saw some stocks traded. Well, we have, can we look at the stocks traded yesterday? We saw Priceland, Double One, PLC, Niger Delta Exploration and Production and Nipco PLC traded in yesterday's trading session. And the advances, we saw Priceland Campina, Wamco, you know, gaining in yesterday trading session, Niger Delta Exploration and Production were the advances in yesterday's trading session. When we look at the fixed income space, the bond space, we saw some, you know, you know, major moves in the 2024, 2034, 2037, and 2042 paper yesterday. But it's closed on a calm, started off on a calm note. Still, uh, we saw cautious trading in most of these stocks. For the 24, 2037, 2042, and 2049 papers, the offers were at 10.65%, 15.2%, 14.85%, and we had 15.25% as well. Average deals remained relatively stable from Tuesday's trading session. And Treasury bills market also on a quiet note. Bullish sentiments continuing yields keep dropping down in the, at the Treasury bills market. All right, Will, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'll hold uh, Oyukasala to her words and yes. see that the markets. <laughs> <laughs> I hope investors will you, take you're advantage. Not even, you're not even, you're not, you're not even, how was the word? Enthusiastic about it. You're just like, okay, I'm just going to hold her to well, it. Well, okay. Yes, yes. the market is going to close <laughs> positive. <laughs> Investors will do a lot of buying today <laughs> because at least there was a dip yesterday. Yes, so yes. Definitely. Is that good enough for yes, you? Yes, proper Okay, all Thank right. You. Thank you so much, Phil. <laughs> all right, let's take a break now. When we come back, we do have the crypto market and uh, Ladi standing somewhere really close. you see him in a minute after the break. Still watching business morning here on Channel Television. We head to crypto space now. We've seen neutral, uncertain decision taking and making by investors in that space. <laughs> I don't know if Ladi has a different story this morning. Uh, we actually have a, we have a decision. Oh, you know, but it's fear. Gone though. back. Why yeah. don't you go the other way? Yeah, with, with that announcement by the Department of oh, Justice. Oh yeah, about the regulations. The US, yes, but about regulations. Are so you guys that, scared of regulation? That drove fear, you know, into. <laughs> you know, are you guys doing you know, something wrong or so shady? The thing is, you know, these investors are quite flaky, you know, in this market. It's just the slightest bad news, and already just take. Because off. I mean, well, if, at the end of the day, you yes. know, they had incredible gains in the first half of. Uh, uh, first uh, week of January, you know, that, that has translated to about $6,000 profit, you know, just from being of so January. So is that going to sustain you guys for the rest of the year? At the end of the day, they will look for any excuse to take profit. <laughs> and that's what we're seeing already in the market. <laughs> uh, so this already is fear. just an excuse. It's an excuse Ladi, to take from profit. you to your investors, this is just an excuse. That's, how, that's the psychology profit. of investors in every market. <laughs> okay. Just take profit. <laughs> All right. Let's look at the market cap now. It sits $968 billion. That's uh, moving farther away from that $1 trillion mark. We're supposed to break that, you know, at some point. But they happen down 2.80%. And we see volume traded there. That's up 24% uh, percent there with the sell-off seen in the market. We see Bitcoin dominance uh, sitting at 41-41% uh, there. Let's uh, look at the price of Bitcoin this morning. 20,828 did get sell-offs yesterday. Did lose about 5% when we got the announcement by the Department of Justice in the U.S. It's down, but it's up about 0.02%. Seen some uh, a brief rebound in the market. Volume traded 41.3 billion dollars. You know, once uh, Bitcoin sneezes, the whole market reacts. Look at the Ethereum there. Not so bad though. 1,528 dollars. Ethereum looking quite strong. This day is not wanting to lose that 1,500 mark, and we see volume traded 18.06 billion dollars. Let's look at the top odds by market cap. They did, they did all get hit, you know, yesterday. We see BNB there, uh, the Binance token for the crypto exchange, did lose that 300 dollar mark, it's down 0.14 percent, all in reaction uh, to that announcement yesterday. Cardano, 33 cents, down 0.27 percent. And the uh, only gain I would see 
uh, this morning is uh, XRP on the top odds by market cap. They're holding on strong, 38 cents, up 0.35%. Uh, Let's uh, bring in Rume Ofi now, financial market analyst. Uh, hello, Rume. Good morning. Good morning, Larry. Good morning. So uh, great to have you, uh, Rume. And uh, yesterday, we, we saw major sell-offs in the market. And obviously, it was uh, after that announcement by the Department of Justice in the U.S., they did send out an announcement of an announcement, and obviously the market reacted, you know, negatively to that. And I'm wondering, uh, uh, Rume, why did the market react to an announcement of an announcement? The, the, the market actually has an interest uh, in all of these, uh, considering the fact that the DOJ is not uh, is a very very strong organization. Coming up with such announcement is going to change a whole lot of things, you know. The truth is that something was really, really that was very clear to me yesterday is that people should understand that crypto is not working in isolation, right? Crypto is not a way people can hide their money because that is the misconception. Although uh, this, some of these technologies uh, usually uh, the, the 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 bad actors usually jump on it faster than those that are doing it genuinely. It's not a reason for someone to say is that uh, it is for bad actors or to hide illicit funds. It has been clear right now uh, that the DOJ of the U.S. have been investigating on how monies have been moving in uh, the, the, the Bitcoin ecosystem. That is, the Bitcoin blockchain is so transparent that money moving in for illicit activities could be seen with softwares. It is not anonymous. That is what people need to know. So this platform is called Bitslato. Uh, it, it's quite unfortunate that a whole lot of us been in this space for a while now have not heard of that name before. It's Hong Kong registered, has been processing transactions from uh, the Russian guys that are uh, doing illicit activity. Considering the fact that there's, re there's high um, restriction on transactions coming from that part of the world, so the DOJ is saying that we will not allow this, and they have actually brought that down with some amount, about $700 million dollars which shows is a plus for me, uh, for the industry, uh, the, the crypto industry globally, and also in Nigeria, so that people will begin to understand that this industry cannot work in isolation. It can work with collaborations with government agencies so that we can be able to fish the bad actors. It makes a whole lot of sense, although a whole lot of us were scared yesterday because we had some anticipation in our mind. Hopefully, it turned out the other way around. Yeah, because but, I remember, so, I remember going on, on Twitter <laughs> yesterday, and obviously... You know, investors were, were scared, major investors in the crypto market. You could see them, you know, trying to figure out what exactly that announcement could be. Some thought it would be something about FTX, but it turned out it, it wasn't that. But, but what does this say, you know, about the industry that uh, an announcement of an announcement, you know, uh, strikes so much fear in the hearts of investors? Yeah, it means, it, it, so, so the, it, it's some total of all what happened yesterday that I figured out. A couple of these big players in the industry, the, uh, the, the big uh, exchange platforms like Binance and the others, are collaborating with government agencies to make sure that this, this industry is safe. That is, if you have information, there's something called in the space travel rules. You know, you have an information about certain funds that have moved through your industry. It is your obligation to report that to the authorities so that when investigations come, you could be exonerated, else you'll be brought into uh, something that you, you didn't plan for. And that can send another shockwave to the industry. So it is good uh, for investors to be scared. Hope my investment is uh, not going to be affected if the platform I am using or invested in is probably conniving with uh, an illicit platform that has had issues with this, this whole thing. Okay, and uh, obviously, you know, this uh, industry boasts of uh, decentralization, but, but it looks like you cannot have true decentralization, you know, in, in this uh, industry, the way it's going. So is it uh, centralized decentralization we're looking forward to in this uh, industry? I, I think the, 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 those that actually came into this space earlier did not, the, the, the market, the, the, the marketing processes of uh, of this whole thing was 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 quite wrong. Trying to tell sell it that oh, this is a space whereby you can push money without uh, being noticed. You can do this. Oh, it's decentralized. Nobody can against government. The truth is that at some point we need certain level of uh, regulation, right? Even though the technology has 
the, uh, the decentralized uh, uh, pr properties doesn't mean that you can just come in and do what you like. So there are centralized exchange and decentralized exchange, even though your platform is decentralized. There are certain things that could go ha that could happen that are responsibility of the government. That's why we have government for other, you know. So it is uh, even though we are decentralized, uh, we need some some level of coordination so that platforms cannot be going bust and people losing money or okay. people bringing all sort of uh, ideas to finance crimes all over the world. It's all going right. to further bring uh, disrepute to the entire industry. But I, I think I like I like the fact that. Even okay. though we are decentralized in nature, we have a way to guard against uncertainties that are going to happen in the future. It's a new technology, right. but we need to embrace it. And obviously, with the way this uh, week is looking, it looks like maybe there might still be some bad news coming on the horizon. But we'll we'll keep tracking and see how it all plays out. Thank you so much, uh, Rume Ofi, financial market analyst. Thank you. Thank you, Ladi. Yeah, so uh, in it, that's it. it. It all depends on how you like your decentralization. Decentralized, you know, centralized market. Yeah, and being your own bank. All of these things, not easy at all. Yeah, not easy, laddie. Thank you so much. We'll all see right. at one thirty. business right. incorporated. All right, see you. Yeah, that's it on the program for this morning. Uh, we'll have a final one tomorrow. Do remember to send us your uh, new Nara experience. Uh, send it to businessmorning at channelstv.com. I'll see you at 10 p.m. Stock Market Report. Have a great day. Thank you.